Welcome back. As you can see, I once again have some company with me. The photobomb kitty has not made an appearance in a while, but today he went out and caught lunch for me. A little dead mouse brought it over to me. I told him I was grateful, but he needs to be petted and preened for it. So, yes, here we go. What a good hunter cat. All right, time to go. Today, we are going to talk about lusterware. So, we'll be back in a minute and we'll just get right into it. Okay, lusterware. Now, in one of our most recent videos, we've discussed lusterware briefly because I picked up a rather large set, a uh, tea set, uh, lusterware at St. Vincent de Paul's thrift store. This is one of the cups. This is made in Bavaria. This was included with it, a saucer. It does, in fact, not match the cup. This was made in Japan. But, as I mentioned in the previous video, it's such a close match, I understand why they were confused and added it. This is the classic lusterware color combination that we are most likely to see among the pieces that we are thrifting. This particular piece is from Japan. Again, Bavaria, Japan. Basically, same thing. And if you are new to lusterware and want to start collecting, I would strongly suggest you start off with pieces like this for the very practical reason that if you start off with pieces in this peach and blue configuration, you can grab additional pieces very easily and just add to your set. Um, some of them will have designs on them. Some of them won't. They'll all blend in together. So let's talk a little bit about the history of lusterware. The history is a lot older than I realized. I found that out when I was doing some research on it. The earliest lusterware pieces are from about the third century, and they are from the Middle East, from what would later become the Islamic Empire. It was made by glazing porcelain with a glaze that had metallic compounds, copper, silver, and um, sometimes gold, by the way, uh, for the very fine pieces. And it would produce this wonderful, lustrous glaze finish. Now, we have occasionally discussed Reku glazes. Reku is R-E-K-U. And it's a type of glaze. Lusterware is not the same. When we discussed Reku glazing, I'm pretty sure I mentioned that it is always a surprise a very experienced ceramist working with a Raku glaze will often say, oh my, when they see their pieces come out of the kill because it fires unpredictably. The pieces are beautiful, just, just breathtaking, some of them, but they're pretty much all kind of accidental. If you make a great Raku piece, you do exactly the same thing on the next piece. It could come out very, very differently. Not so with lusterware. As you can see, if they could come up with this piece in Japan, this piece in Bavaria, I would suspect they are at least 20 or 30 years apart in terms of their age. Lusterware is very, very predictable. Now, 
modern lusterware because we are certainly not going to be collecting the lusterware from you know the third century in the pre-ottoman empire by the way if you do contact a museum those are staggeringly valuable pieces and should not be kept by individuals what we're looking at is relatively modern work these pieces were produced well, they had been produced from the third century onward, but they were produced in abundance in the early 19th century. And they were coming out of some of the best uh, porcelain companies in England. Um, of course, these are Bavaria, Japan. Not all of them were coming out of England. But in England, the companies that were producing them among others, were Staffordshire and Wedgwood, the potteries that, that we all know, even if you don't collect ceramics, you've heard of Staffordshire or Wedgwood. Originally, the metallic glazes were created with small amounts of silver or platinum, and they were designed to mimic sterling silver. So your tea set would be a silvered um, glaze, a, a very beautiful pearlescent iridescent silvered glaze over porcelain. Gorgeous, much less expensive than real silver. So they were an instant hit. And it's interesting to note how they were displayed because this can give us a lot of hints in terms of how we can display our lusterware today. They put them on mirrors or in front of mirrors or on silver trays. And the low levels of light, because keep in mind, we're talking early 19th century here. This is the Jane Austen era. This is, you know, Lizzie Bennet's dining room table. They, they just sparkled and glowed. Um, I have actually placed lusterware on silver trays and looked at it in low light. I don't have any of them in that silver finish that's no longer popular, but it's amazing just how much better they look when they're on a reflective surface. So if you are a collector of lusterware, absolutely give it a try hit up a dollar store, get a cheap little mirror circle, pop your lusterware on it, put it in a low light situation and take a look. It's amazing. And that was how our modern lusterware became popular and got itself established uh, so that, you know, we have these 20th century pieces. Now the heyday for lusterware in the U.S was from maybe 1920 through 1950. A lot of the pieces, as I've mentioned, came from Japan. Japan, uh, the Japanese are, are just, uh, they do wonders with ceramics, with glazes, and they were able to create some incredible lusterware pieces and all kinds of pieces. Now, I have a few here. Uh, this is a piece, is the little saucer that goes with it. These were from the Goodwill. And we have a quail or possibly a roadrunner. It looks rather like a roadrunner to me. I don't know if quails are native to Japan. I can certainly say that everybody has access to Saturday morning cartoons. So who knows, maybe that's where the influence came from. But these are exceptionally nice pieces in terms of their style, their design. Here is our standard glue, as you can see. Um, it's a slightly different shade. It's a little lighter, a little more gray. But this blue is one of the classic lusterware colors. And then we have a sort of yellowish green band around it and then the floral designs are just sort of coming out of nowhere it's a very abstract kind of
kind of pattern. That's one of the reasons this particular set appealed to me so. The pattern is just so abstract and frankly so Japanese. In this set, I believe I got six of these bread and butter plates and four saucers. These are not going to be sold as a set. These are going to be drilled. These are going to turn into tidbit trays because, come on, wow. This is another, uh, and Japan also, as, as were these, this was uh, another of the pieces I picked up at St. Vincent de Paul on uh, Thursday. Wonderful, very abstract sort of pattern. Very Japanese. It's an odd little set. It's a saucer and a creamer. Uh, clearly, this came from a much larger set, and either these are the only two pieces that survived, or they were the only two pieces that were left in the store when I came in. This is terrific. This is a piece that is just going to be offered for sale independently because it's uh, as a creamer, as a standalone piece, this is going to be useful. Someone is going to want it. This one, however, oh, you guessed it, tidbit tray material. This one does not have the blue of this, but it does have the peach. Which is why I say you start with the peach and the blue and you're going to find no end of the number of pieces you can combine with it. And I can easily see these pieces going together in a sort of mismatch set. And I personally have nothing against mismatch. I rather like it. These pieces, and these are just cups and saucers, um, Lusterware, thin, thin blue band. Again, we're looking at the same blues here. White with some small flowers. And again, blue and white. These are very small teacup. Look well, here, take a look at the difference in the size. This is what we would consider a teacup. This is what the Japanese would consider a teacup. And the size difference is really striking. These are lovely pieces. You very often find these stray lusterware cups and saucers. There is not a strong market for the lone cup and saucer. However, we're going to deal with that in a future video if you happen to come across these. Um, I have sold some largely on the strength of the pattern. If this piece had been a creamer, in, or had been a cup rather, instead of a creamer, okay, well, it's, I, I would not have the least bit of trouble selling them as a set. But the pieces that I have sold just as lone little cups and saucers, uh, one of them was from Luray Caverns. It was a souvenir. That was purchased by someone who was not interested in the Luray Cavern aspect, but she happened to collect cardinals and was just taken with the piece, as was I, which is why I bought it. And the other little cup and saucer went to a collector who likes small bits of Japanese porcelain. Um, she likes Japanese porcelain, that's what she collects, but she also has rather a fondness for the miniatures. Worked out well. This set of, and it's three cups and saucers, I would not try to sell. If I had four, if I had six, sure, because then somebody might scoop them up. But as they are, they're not going to be an easy sell. As a consequence, I'm going to show you a different option for pieces like these. But as I say, that is off in the future. And here is our friend, the lamp. 
that was rewired two, two videos ago, I think. Lusterware. This is a beautiful, um, it's, it's sort of a mottled and feathered green. Um, I'm going to move it over and the camera is going to refocus. Let's see if you can't get a better picture of that. I'm going to move it around a little because the light is catching it and reflecting. But you can still see this sort of striations in the color. Very nice. One of the things that attracted me to this piece in the first place was this beautiful lusterware finish. So let me show you some pictures of different lusterware pieces. Most of these pieces I, I purchased and already sold. They, they have found homes. But I want you to see the incredible variety of types of items that you can find. Because when we talk about lusterware, we're talking about the finish only, just the glaze. Um, lusterware can be anything, and we've got everything in this little stack of pictures. So here you go. This is a pretty decent assortment of lusterware, and we'll give you an idea of what to look for. Okay, as you can see, all sorts of items are glazed in these lustrous glazes. And remember that they acquired this, this pearlescence from metals being added to the glazes. And before, walk away from this altogether, remember this little piece. Now, here it is with its little front pattern, but also the same peach once again. So, I absolutely believe lusterware is worth collecting. It's worth looking at as a good resale item. 
it's retained popularity over the years. And as I said, there are people who just collect this stuff. If I was not quite so close to being a hoarder already, I think I would consider it too, because it's just beautiful to look at. So this is our 50 cents worth of lusterware. So given the fact that this was a relatively short tour of lusterware, um, let's talk about a few other things. I got a question from a viewer, and this is about, and here, a term that I use, that a lot of people use, but if you look it up in a dictionary, you are not going to find the same definition. See the piercing along the side of this, it's like what they would call a gallery tray. It's reticulated. Reticulated. The little piercings. Now, the dictionary definition of reticulated is having a net-like design or pattern. A reticulated python, for example, if you've ever seen a picture of a reticulated python, it has that sort of net-like design. I'm, I'm always tempted to say network, but of course that means so many different things today. Um, 200 years ago, a reticule was a lady's handbag, a little netted bag with a little drawstring at the top. Often they were beaded. Reticule, net, that's where it comes from. And this is a term we use, not just me, this is a commonly used term, and I have no idea why the dictionary is not recognizing it. I should probably write somebody a letter about it. It's this pierced design. This would be called a reticulated plate or a plate with a reticulated edge. If I said this to anyone dealing with porcelain, they would know exactly what I meant. But the dictionary hasn't quite caught up with us yet. So here, this is our tidbit tray giveaway. And as you can see, the second plate is reticulated. This plate is also probably going to end up going into a tidbit tray because I happen to think that reticulated plates look very nice, especially when you mix them with other plates. I think it gives a lot of visual interest to a tray. When I find reticulated plates or plates with highly unusual edges, I scoop them up and tuck them off in the tidbit tray stash. So, reticulated, and that's something I'm sorry I didn't define before, but we had a little bit of time because this video was a little shorter, so we got a chance to do this. Tidbit tray. The winner of the tidbit tray, and I'm sure I'm going to get this wrong and butcher it completely, but I will be writing it out in the notes under this video. Sissy Maynaw's daughter, Sissy, May, Sissy Maynaw's daughter, Nanny Mager. Forgive me, I'm sure I have butchered it. I do know how to spell it. I will spell it out. You are the winner of the tidbit tray. Please write to me at the pen giveaway address and I'll make sure you get your tray. Okay, pen winners. I have another picture of a pen winner. So let me show you that. Okay, and I have a picture back from the winner of the compact. 
the compact, if you'll recall, was donated by Karen Hopper. She had donated some beautiful jewelry pieces, and this compact was one of them. And I asked the new owner if I could have a picture of the compact in its new home. And boy, she took me at my word. So the compact is now living in a 19th century Georgian Revival home. And we've got a picture of the exterior of the home and a picture of the interior. It's a beautiful room that apparently is still under restoration. But my goodness, they are doing an excellent job. So let's take a, pic, let's take a, a peek at this compact and its new digs. So here you go. And while we are on the subject of the giveaways, let me mention that Lisa has told me this. Oh, she's told me this several times, and I keep forgetting to mention it. The pens are refillable. You can pull this refill, or this, this pen, just pull the whole thing out and shove another standard Bic refill in here. So for the pen winners, when your pen runs out of ink, Fear not, a big refill will load it right back up again. Um, pen winners, I've gotten a huge number of requests, and I am gradually getting through the process of filling them all. Um, as I have mentioned many times, going to mention it again, priority is going to go to the people with disabilities who need the, need the pens because they need something that they can grip firmly. So that is always going to be the priority. Everyone is welcome to enter. I hope to get around to everybody sooner or later, but I hope you'll bear with me knowing that people who need them are going to get them first. And um, you, know, you are a wonderful patient crowd, so I'm sure I can rely on you for that. So. That's what's going on for us today. Lusterware, reticulation, pen refills, our tidbit tray giveaway. And next time out is going to be our project video. So it will be the let's roll up our sleeves, let's put on our safety glasses, and let's go to work. And I will see you then. In the meantime, have a fantastic day.